for the invitation. It's my first time here at Saclay. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, not my first time in Paris, but here. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the effective theory approach to gravitational dynamics that a bunch of us have been working in collaboration with a bunch of people, including I.R. Roskin, who I don't see now in the audience. But he will speak He's over there. OK, he will speak after me, and he will give all the details that I will leave out uh, in my talk. OK, he's not yet entering. OK, fine. So gravitational waves needs a introduction, of course. We've heard a lot about it. Uh, so far, you sat through many colloquiums, probably. But I think it's good to emphasize that uh, the discovery potential in gravitational wave observations to maximize, maximize the discovery potential relies on our ability to make precise uh, theoretical predictions, the same way that we do with the Large Hadron and hence my title from the LHC uh, to LISA. So for us, what is the standard model? I don't know what that hand is doing there. Okay. So what is the standard model? So for us, the standard model will be gravity or general relativity plus whatever is out there, the uh, compact objects that then collide and emit gravitational waves that we can then observe uh, through LIGO and in the future maybe LISA or the Einstein uh, telescope. So I'm going to assume that general relativity is correct, so I'm not going to do long distance modifications of GR like Leonardo was discussing earlier briefly. So most of the new physics for me will come from the uh, right hand side of the Einstein's equations, including the gravitational degrees of freedoms, as we will see as uh, with an effective free theory approach. So very good. So you know there is the spiral, the merger, and the ringing in, in, in phases of the evolution. You know that the first detection was mostly a uh, merger. We didn't really see much of the ringing. And the first detection of the neutral star binary was mostly in spiral, actually completely in spiral. The, the merger was outside the LIGO band. So I'm not going to tell you much about this too. We heard a little bit about the ringing from Ricardo. So I'm going to concentrate mostly on the because, um, well, first, because of the effective field theory approach, because we can disentangle the scales. It's a neat separation of scales, as we will see. Also, because we can use analytic tools, the post Newtonian expansion. But moreover, because in the future, once uh, detectors uh, operate at uh, design capabilities, uh, sorry, design sensitivities, we will get the majority of the cycles in the spiral phase. So we get thousands of cycles in band. And hopefully, I don't know when this is going to happen, maybe Kira will tell us, but we'll see hundreds of events a year mostly in spiraling. Okay, so we really need to reconstruct the signal very well. We're gonna learn a lot of physics from gravitational wave observations. We need to have a control of the in spiral regime, which is the regime in which we can use analytic expansions, the post expansion, and in which effective field theory will give us a handle on how to tackle uh, the problem. As we will see, we have two <coughs> kinds of effective field theories. Um, often, we, we use effective field theory to parameterize our ignorance about new physics, or what's out there, for us, in the UV, in the short distance, for example, if you have a neutron star and you want to know about the equation of the standard neutron star, what's happened in the compact object inside, the degrees of freedom that live inside the compact object, that's going to be on this side, so that will be one kind of effective theory. But then, obviously, when you have a theory that you understand very well, for example, QCD, but it's very hard to solve, you can also use effective field theory methods, in this case, for the left-hand side of the Einstein equations, which is general relativity, which we understand very well. But in the case at hand, which is the inspired regime, there's a separation of scales that allow us to apply also effective field theories the same way that we do in QCD. For example, HQT or RQCD, that can also be used here. And you will uh, see we will introduce, or Ira and, and Walter introduce this idea of uh, energy uh, that will be uh, very useful. So we're basically going to EFT the both sides of our stance equation. So very good. So let me just tell you a little bit about where we are right now to motivate why we keep doing this and uh, why we're going to move forward. What is the state of the art? So this is uh, solving the dynamics. Uh, uh, this is the orbital frequency, but it's also tracking the frequency of the gravitational wave. Right now, after a concerted effort that started before all of us were born with Einstein and Infer Hoffman, that was the first post-Newtonian correction to the dynamics, uh, uh, the conservative part, just the, the Einstein for Hoffman potential, and through like then Chandra Sekhar, I think in the 60s, and eventually a bunch of people like Blanchet, who's not too far from here, Damour and uh, uh, Gahashev, Peter Janotsky, the German and Polish. Now we have understood the dynamics and ourselves, once we include the spin effect, 
that were included for the first time using this effective zero approach. We understand the dynamics now up to next to next to next to lean order. And including some uh, effects that account for half, like some dissipative effects that half of post-Newtonian orders. We understand the dynamics now up to 3.5 post-Newtonian orders, which means beyond the celebrated uh, quadruple formula. Now, uh, when I gave this talk in, in QCD discoveries, we complained that I didn't say who x was. So x is the expansion parameter, it's the relative velocity. And nu is the mass ratio, which is the symmetric mass ratio because we have comparable masses. So this is invariant under m1 goes to m2. But essentially, it gives you an idea of the mass ratio. So here goes the chill mass. And eventually, the, the higher order effects allow us to disentangle the parameters, such, such as the individual masses and the spins and so on. So 3.5 pn, and this was finished roughly around 2000. This is where I installed my PhD for the non-spinning part. Was done around the, the 2000s. So the good question, the, the 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 question that you might ask, okay, this is very good for detection. We have detected. We have some rough idea of the parameters of the uh, of the uh, events that we had. The question is like, are we ready for the future? Is this good? Is this going to be the best we can possibly do for sure now? But is it all we need to extract and characterize the events that we're going to observe in the future? And obviously the answer is no. This is not good enough. And this is um, the two sides of the coin. So one is that, OK, the future is going to be great in terms of gravitational wave observations. We're going to do much better than advanced LIGO. Maybe with the Einstein telescope and with LISA, the machines are fantastic in terms of the empirical reach. Just thinking about the empirical reach, this is not good enough. And this was also uh, what Alessandra told us recently last year. For those of you who do know who she is, Alessandra Bonanos, the director of the Max Planck Institute in Boston, who has a bunch of people working on gravitational wave modeling. So gravitational wave experiments on the ground in space require more accurate waveforms, but it's not right now. And that's the interesting part about the challenges and the opportunities in this field. But for us, or for us who were educated as biophysicists, there is also an opportunity because there is a threshold, we love thresholds, where we can learn about new physics. And this threshold leaves at five orders beyond the quadruple formula, or what is called the fifth post order. This is a threshold at which we can distinguish the nature of the compact objects. Because thus far, where we are, and we are scratching the surface of the end of the calculation of the four post order, we cannot distinguish with these waveforms whether we have a black hole or a neutron star. Unless you have a counterpart, for example, neutron star, the first neutron star event that was observed, it had a counterpart, as we saw. I forgot which talk, somebody <coughs> showed this. Uh, was it you, Lam? Uh, what, what was you? OK, exactly. But then we uh, claim to have seen two more events of neutron stars. Where's Michele? Uh, two neutron binaries that, that do not have a counterpart. So we don't know whether those were neutron stars, were black holes, or whether they will stick. Is that correct? No, we don't even. Exactly. So we'll get to that. So we don't have the waveforms right now without counterpart to tell apart the nature of the objects. Why? Because gravity is derivatively coupled. So as you'll see when I construct the effect to say on the right hand side of the equation, that the first that tells you uh, about the distinction that is just beyond the mass will enter at five plus Newtonian orders and is associated with tidal effects. And it's very easy to see what this effect is. It's the, the tidal deformation, the same way that susceptible in electrodynamics, you put an electric field, you generate a dipole, you put a gravitational field, you put a quadruple, but this quadruple costs you more, more derivatives. Then you couple this to gravity, and essentially you get a curvature square operator that essentially enters at this order. And just from scaling, you'll see that this guy scales like the fifth power of the size, and you'll see when we put it in a binary that enters at v to the 10. So just from the point of view of gravity, without counterpart, if we want to be able to distinguish the nature of the compact objects, we need to go to next to next to next to next to next to linear. OK? So we're not there yet. And we, we have this as a very natural pressure for uh, new physics. So let me tell you, I will mean, what kind of new physics we can learn. And I think this will be part of the majority of our talk. So there is something which we don't really understand is that this guy, this first operator that captures tidal deformability in the limit in which essentially you go to the static limit, you put some electric field, and you generate a dipole. And it's a permanent dipole if you have a permanent electric field. So the same happened here with a gravitational field. Of course, there will be some 
calculation, but as the system slows, you have a leftover corpo. Well, the black holes do ring, but afterwards, even if you keep a constant field, it doesn't want to deform. So you essentially have this zero deformability, or tidal deformability, which is also known as the log number. So black holes do not deform in the static limit. And I wrote a little thing called the tune of love, and love is because it's called the love number. Uh, we don't know if, this, if there's a deeper reason why this term is not there. This is clearly offering a great opportunity to test whether this effect is there or not, whether the black holes could have dressing of all kinds, including classical, quantum, or perhaps even new states that we can probe a disorder. Because, for example, something that I've been exploring uh, with Daniel and Hon Schoen, a brilliant student, um, what is the possibility that the black hole could be dressed by some new particles, some new, new ultralight particles? Well, if those guys are there, and, and this is something that we learn also from Sergei uh, and Mika, uh, stability, you can create these condensates. Those condensates will be around, hopefully for a long time, so this is like temporary hair. But if you put these guys in a binary, they will clearly form, uh, they will clearly have tidal effects, they will show tidal effects, because now they will dominate over just the zero of the black hole. And in fact, we estimate these tidal effects to be very large to be very important and to measure, we found also the style effects could be time dependent, so to measure very precisely the style effects for binary black holes that create clouds, we can learn and constrain the properties of ultralight particles uh, in nature. And there's another way in which we can do that, but it's also complemented by what Lam uh, told us and, and uh, also the ringing phase that we heard uh, from Ricardo. So very good. So we want to get to the threshold at which we can distinguish the nature of the sources because of course as we say that we can learn about equation state of Newton stars so we can also learn about QCD we can probe new physics in the form of ultralight particles or dark matter uh, different kinds of dark matter we're exploring now the possibility of vectors not just scales that they could also uh, condensate around the black holes so we can explore new physics, we can see if this tidal low number of black holes are zero, maybe there are quantum effects that give us another one correction. By the way, as you know, the neutron stars are out there and they're about 10 kilometers because of quantum effects. Without quantum mechanics, a neutron star would be the size of a neutron. So clearly, I mean, it could be that we are there for a while and there are <coughs> uh, new things in the sky that we haven't yet uh, seen. So this is the name of the game through gravitational wave precision data by reproducing the signal from the inspired first to high level of accuracy. Lots of cycles in that with lots of events a year. We're going to um, explore uh, the universe in a way that we haven't done it before, as we usually. OK, so now let me, um, so I don't have much time. But let me just introduce briefly, uh, sorry, the effective field theory, the effective field theory approach, because I think many of you may not have been exposed to this idea of the effective field theory approach for gravitational dynamics, um, which was uh, originally introduced by uh, Ira and Walter in 2004, even though it took a while to publish for different reasons that uh, I can tell you privately. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and it was my, my thesis was to include spin. Ira came to me and said, okay, we have this theory and we don't know how to create spin here with this and do the spinning case and that's what I did and that's where the new results came out so it was very productive and it's a bunch of us who've been exploring this since and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more throughout the talk so that's the first so I, I tell you two kinds of uh, effective theories so on the left and the right side of Einstein's equation so first on the right side so what about the TNU size which by the way if you're looking at long distance perturbations or what I mean, for example, uh, the curvature, uh, we have the binary in a gravity at long distances. So even the short distance gravitational degrees of freedoms, we can treat as if they are on the uh, right side of the equation, even though the gravitational degrees of freedom, we can also treat them as if they were T mu moves in the right side of the equation. So I'm not saying anything very deep, I'm saying that if you have long, you can have short, and this could be like as if. Uh, I had a team, you know. So I'm also including the case of pure gravity in this analysis, even though pure gravity is G mu equals zero or R mu equals zero. Okay? So what we usually do is you integrate out short distance degrees of freedom. So say you have, a, for example, in that, in that case, in what I'm illustrating here, say you have a charged sphere with a bunch of particles inside, 
particles, and you perturb it with an external electric field. So if this guy is a longer length perturbation, much longer than the size of the object, so beyond, the, I'm doing the gravitational case the, there, but it's exactly the same with the susceptibility that I was explaining before. So beyond the mass, the first thing that you can write down in a bone particle effective action will be the coupling to the curvature. This is the electric component of the bio tensor, but if you were doing QED, this will be the dipole P dot E, and this will be the first thing that you will include to incorporate the final side effect. So we're doing the same here, and I will continue with this idea to understand uh, the response functions of black holes to perturbations. We're doing the same, except that gravity is special, so first derivatives you can gauge away, and traces you can gauge away, so essentially you end up with this electric and magnetic component of the vial tensor, and the first operator that you have down goes if you have a permanent uh, uh, quadrupole, this will be uh, a permanent Q. If it's a response, this Q will go also like E, so the operator will, will look like E squared. And this E squared is the reason, too many derivatives, is the reason why it enters a very high post Newtonian order. So that's the first effective theory that we do. And then what we do is to complete the fact of action. So these people have looked at it in, in, in different ways. So here, imagine that we're just doing it fully relativistically. We haven't done the post expansion yet. So what we're doing here is integrating out the, it's all classical here. So there are no loops of the gravitational field, but this is the Einstein Hilbert action. This is now my point particle action. After I integrate out the short distance degrees of freedom, I, t I take two of those guys, I put them in a binary. So each one of them is described by a point particle effective action. Now it couples to long distance gravity. This will be long distance gravity. This could be the point particle effective action of black holes. So this would be the short distance gravity, not necessarily a neutron, it would be just pure gravity. It will also be described as a point particle action with some multiple moments. And then we base, erase, this is just fancy words, right? This just, we solve for the full H and we plug it back into the action, except that with the path integral and the side point, which has three level coupled to uh, uh, point like sources. It's just it's a way to reorganize the calculation in terms of Feynman diagrams. Okay, so and this computes the effective action. So this will be like your partition function. And when I get this guy, now the real part of this guy will give you the binding, which people looked at this long time ago um, to compute, for example, the static potential between two quarks, right? Or uh, now the trick uh, you can use uh, uh, Feynman boundary conditions and the cuts, the marginal part will give you the radiation. It's completely classical because we're not doing any loops, any gravitational loops, or H bar, we'll enter just as a conversion factor, really. These are the static sources that are described by my point particle theory. These guys will come from the einstein hilbert action, and we're just gonna go ahead and compute, get real parts and imaginary parts, we get the binding and the uh, radiation. Now, because we treat these point particles, when you iterate these functions, you run into divergences. This was one of the problems originally in the, in the traditional approaches. And I should say that people looked at this as, in fact, I think it was Duff, the first who looked, I forgot if it was the 70s or not, that what he reproduced for with this method, which is if you compute the one point function here, you can reproduce the Schwarzschild solution as an expansion in one over R. In that case, if it's a static, there is no radiation. So there is high epsilon that you need to worry about. So it's all static. And this here will be like an expansion of Green's functions, and then you get the operator from here that in the static limit will be just one over k square vector so it will be a one over r and all the nonlinearities will give you the one over r square and so on and so forth this was done by Duff in the 70 and Damour, Timo Damour and a bunch of people have also done this to compute the binding energy which is essentially what I just said just plug it back into the action so for the field plug it back into the action okay so in in some minutes you can do this and if you do this fully relativistically, you have all the time dependence that you need to include, and that's when it gets interesting. So <coughs> people have done this in the past, so what is the new thing that energy R brings to the table? What energy R brings to the table, which is similar to what people did with NRQCD, is when you have two modes in the problem. One is the separation of the scales and the gravitational field that we're solving for here and plug it back into the action have two regions or two relevant regions that will contribute when we iterate these Green's functions. So this looks like a Feynman integral here, so we're gonna get Feynman-like integrals that will be just iterations of Green's functions, so it will look the same as if you were doing loops. And the reason that looks the same is because essentially we have local sources, so you integrate on momenta, and that's 
into divergences because of localized sources. In fact, if, if we were giving this talk to a relativist, uh, um, uh, Georg proved that GR plus localized sources is inconsistent. And, and I, I don't care because I do this as, as an effective theory. And that means that I can regularize my theory by adding counter terms and essentially these guys will regularize the theory, will absorb all the divergences from the iteration of the Green's function. So this is the way in which we solve this, this issue. Yes, we treat this as localized sources, but we have all the counter terms to absorb the divergences. And this is something that we will use to remove the UV pores that we're going to have when we start iterating uh, Green's functions. So what is the new thing <coughs> that we bring into the table? It's because here we have these iterated Green functions, so we have a bunch of integrals, Feynman integrals, and we have different regions that contribute to the integral because we're interested in different questions. We want a real part that gives me the binding energy, and we have want the imaginary part, essentially when the, the poles in the propagators go on shape that give you to the radiation. So we do this splitting, and we can do this splitting at the level of the factor theory, which is also what people did in, in uh, what is called as NRQCD, or also in RQED in the case of uh, electrodynamics, which is separate this integral into two modes, which means when we have this integral here, we can expand the propagators. For example, we look at something which is called the potential mode, which is, okay, we have the full relativistic propagator inside the iterative green function that looks like a loop integral, even though it's completely classical, and we expand it before we integrate, we expand it. So this was an attempt to show the first correction to the static propagator that would be the one over P squared, and this P0 will be like a time derivative because we're in the regime in which there is a separation between the scale of radiation and the scale of the binding. So the typical wavelength of the radiation is much longer by a factor of V compared to the binding uh, separation. Therefore, all the time variation that will be associated with the motion, which is small, will be velocity down. It will be corrections induced by velocity. And therefore, we can power count. This will be the leading static effect this will be me, give me B square corrections. Of course, we're going to change all the UV physics. Of course, it could be that we generate new divergences by doing this. But the good thing in the fact of theory to, and the idea of the method of region of asymptotic expansion is that if you take the full answer and you expand, it's the same as, as expanding the integrand and, and expanding. So up to some poles, and you have to regularize the poles. But that's what the counter test will do. That's what the counter test will do for us. As we will see in a second, some of the intermediate poles better cancel out, and this will be a uh, part of the calculation. By doing this splitting into potential and radiation modes, so it's very easy to see the potential modes are the ones that I span like this. The radiation modes are the ones that I don't span, but because they are on long scales, I'm going to treat them as a background when I do this integral. So I first solve my potential modes, which are my UV physics, and, and I match into an effective theory which I have now the binary as a point particle carrying some multiple moments. And then I solve for the radiation modes, for example, doing diagrams like this. And here I can compute the imaginary parts that will give me the power. So the key here is what happens when we have potentials coupled to radiation modes, which is in a nonlinear theory like general relativity. And what happens there is two things. One, this quadruple moment of the binary gets dressed up by corrections that are induced by the binding energy. So it won't be just mxx, as we used to with uh, multiple expansions. It will get corrected by GM of R effects. So this will be part of the matching, part of matching my full theory with potentials and radiation modes into a theory that has multiples and only radiation modes. And the other thing that can happen is that the radiation itself can talk to the potential of the binary. This is often called the tail effect. And this will be very important because this will correct the effects of the radiation, the radiating power. And it turns out something that we learned recently, it can also contribute to the binding. So there will be effects due to the radiation scattering up the geometry that essentially will redress what we mean by the binding energy. And this will play an important role in the calculation of the binding energy and power at uh, high orders. OK, this is very schematic. Yes. Second. The, this, yeah, good question. Yeah, here I'm abusing. So what happens is like the, these are static sources, and this line means potential, which is a one over p square vector only. So this is a static. This guy is a correction of expanding the propagator. So this is the one region. Now in the other one, I should have written. This is the 
it, that has a quadrupole itself. But the double line instead illustrates the fact that it's the back is shrunk. And just historically, we did that way. It's not that there is any, any degree of freedom here. It's just to illustrate uh, this fact. But, but the, the moral of the method, the new thing of the method that had not been done before, is to realize this, this asymptotic expansion that allows you to do these integral steps and basically do one step at a time. We have a fully relativistic integral, which is very complicated. We expand it in regions. There is a potential region and there is a radiation region. And by doing this step, we can first march into a theory that has a, a point-like binary dressing up some multiple moments and then computing and solving for the radiation and getting uh, the power. So um, I will give you more details. Um, OK, so why, why? So notice what happened. So we are here fully relativistic, iterating this function, essentially iterating these functions. The, um, the binding from the, from the part that is real, the real part that, that doesn't go on shell, so we expand the propagators. The parts that go on shell, that gives me the cats, as uh, hold on here because there will be contributions if, through the radiation reaction force that can also shift. But what happens if we can bypass all these iterating green functions? Because at the end, we end up with a bunch of fine because we're doing this, this path integral in the third point approximation, but basically weak, rotation, weak contractions that give me these iterated green functions. So the question is, can we bypass this fine monology? And this is something that has happened recently that the people in amplitudes have started looking at this problem after the And we're going to have a big program uh, together with JJ, Ilya, who is an astrophysicist, and Donna, who is also an amplitudes person, and Fabian, who is a cosmologist. So um, the title is similar to uh, my talk. Um, where we're going to discuss about what the methods in which, OK, you can compute this. You took the limit in which essentially it's, the, it's what you call the heavy core uh, uh, limit. So you really have a propagator, but we're going to collapse the propagator to a static source. This is like the, a little more than one over m in the heavy core expansion. Um, so what if you don't do that? What if you compute the amplitude using some method that maybe God given method, double copy and unitarity method, and so on, which by the way has been done, for example, up to two loop order. In in okay, some discussion here about whether they can do the interest or not, uh, but. <laughs> But uh, let's say, let's say uh, this can be done, and it's uh, two orders in velocity. By that I mean that whether there is an expansion or not, whether one can do the integral without expanding in P0s, or one has to expand in P0 and then resum. There are some issues, but one can get the integrand, and then the issue is just do the integral, bypassing all the Feynman technology. From 2 to 2 scattering amplitude in the fully quantum regime, we can extract the classical limit by looking at a large impact parameter, so it cues the transfer the transfer momentum, we take the Q goes to zero limit, M goes to infinity. And in that limit, we can start the classical piece by matching into a theory of local potentials. And this was done originally by Ira and, and Beth, new, uh, and then I took order to get the first uh, the 2 p.m. Uh, effect by, by Cliff, Ira, and Mike Solon, and more recently by Byrne and company uh, to uh, third post-Moskian order this matching and the matching had to be done order by order so here you have to compute up to two loops and there's an iteration of these coefficients that will give me the binding potential this can read off from your technology and then you match and then you get the the, um, the potential now there is a lot of potential for these methods right now this three plus minkowskian order only knows about second post newtonian order and i'm telling you that we are the fourth post newtonian order so there is still a way to go. Even though it includes a lot of velocity terms, it stops at GQ, whereas the fourth post-Newtonian order includes up to G5, which will mean they need to do four loops here, OK? But we see a path of, of maybe some hybrid approach in which these tools can help us streamline the computations that we do. And that's why I'm advertising the program that we have. OK, uh, how much time do I have? Oh, really? Oof. Um, so where are we right now? So <coughs> we, we're finishing, well, we finished. So we want to keep going to 5 PM. That's the threshold in which we're going to be able uh, to learn about the structure of the objects, the characterize the nature of the objects. Um, I told you about 3.5 PM that was done actually without spin. It was done in the 2000s. Uh, we included, uh, uh, I'll tell you in a second, what, what did we do that we could
could ha it have not been done before. But if we ignore spin for, for the time being, and we just go to the dams that I show you for the potential modes, just the binding, ignore the radiation for now, the fourth order, the potential to fourth post-Newtonian order has to be computed that allows us to obtain the binding energy to fourth post-Newtonian order, which is one of the ingredients plus the flux that allows us to get the phase all of the orbital frequency, which allows us to get the phase of the gravitational wave, which will be observed by LIGO and so on. So this is the fourth post-Newtonian order. X is my expansion parameter, so it goes to X to the four. There is another expansion parameter, mu, which is also associated with the people doing the gravitational step force. There's also things that we can do. I don't have time to tell you, so I'm not going to uh, tell you much about this. This had been computed earlier by Damu, Janoski, and Schaeffer, and more recently by Blanchet. And we finished this calculation uh, this year, uh, three months ago. But let me tell you a few features about this. And what we were able to do that, that uh, basically went a little farther than the previous methods. And why we think that our method can, and um, with uh, onshore methods, we can really move forward, and I'm not so sure about uh, the other tools. So, okay, so at four point in order, we have iterations like this. Now, ignore this line. This will be like sources. It's just that historically, we make lines like this, even though it doesn't propagate. This here, there's a decomposition because we have the full H mu that we're integrating now, but then you have a scalar and you have a tensor, so you can have diamonds like this. And this was something that uh, Stefano, uh, Ricardo, Pier Paolo, and Christian worked out. And there are integrals like this that were very difficult to do, and then Pier Paolo did it. Oh, you can map these guys to self energies because essentially these guys, these lines don't propagate, so it's like the same as a self energy. So there's three dimensional, four loop, three dimensional self energies, massless. Uh, all of them could be done with master integrals except for one. And, and Paolo did this, um, Pier Paolo did this uh, uh, numerically, as a, as, and then and then did a test, and, and uh, this, this uh, expansion in trust and delta numbers, I'm not sure how this works, but he got an analytic expression. But it turns out that you can do it in coordinate space, and you can do it faster, so there are things here to improve upon. But the good thing was that uh, this, this is very systematic. Once you get this integral, you plug it in here, and you're done. And it also gives you for free the static component of the 5 p.m. potential, just because of factorization property that you can show very easily. So this method very quickly gives you uh, new results. Um, the thing that I found most interesting is the fact that there is a logarithm here, which is, uh, is at four plus Newtonian order. So this is before the, uh, the high dimensional operator that I told you at 5 p.m. It's not the fact that it's not there. But if it had been there, it could run. It could give you a log. But it's not there. Or know that, but it's this, uh, this, log, this log appears at 4 p.m. This is before there is any chance for this operator to show up with a log running. So this cannot be a UV log. It has to be an IR log. So what is this IR log doing here? Where is the infrared physics coming from? Now it turns out, uh, and, and I liked it so much that I had to write a paper about it, that this is the lamp shift. This is a completely classical gravitational lamp shift in the binding energy of binary black holes. And it's the same idea, and it has to do with this theorem that I told you before about the radiation scattering of the geometry and redressing the binding energy through radiation reaction effects. This is quantum mechanical, this is completely classical, and this log actually we worked out many years ago, well, maybe three years ago, and it turns out that there is, there is, there is more to it that, than just the logarithm. The logarithm often doesn't come along, the Lamsche has a long history coefficients that were uh, incorrectly computed, a very famous 5 over 6. So this log comes also with a coefficient that we were able also to compute many years ago, and that led to, uh, that uh, had or induced a lot of problems in the traditional methods. So very quickly, let me tell you why they had an issue recovering this log. And the reason is that when they did this calculation, there is a near sum calculation and a far sum calculation. So they try to combine the two. But what happens is that they found that there were infrared divergences in the calculation of the uh, near sum, which has to be because this law has to be an infrared law. And the same happens here, by the way. So ha when they started regularizing their calculation, they realized that it was regularization dependent. They got different answers depending on which regulator did they use. So how did they solve this problem? They put some ambiguity parameter, which is associated with these infrared divergences. But how can you fit this? So what they did is that they, because appears a living order in the mass ratio. They went to their friends that do uh, self force calculations that also compute the binding energy, and then they match. And they match and they obtain the number. 
Okay, it was not obtained purely from post-Newtonian, it, it relied on a matching to a, another calculation. So it wasn't determined for uh, first principle. And in fact, okay, this is just for, but um, this, so then the, the, so there are two methods there. Yeah? The one method that was used by Janowski, uh, uh, Schaefer, and Damour, and another method which is done by Luc Blanchet and Laura Barnard, who maybe is in the audience. Is Laura here? No. Ah. Um, so they disagree, and they disagree because they have different ambiguities. And in fact, Thibault, who I wish was here, uh, wrote another paper in which he said, let's put ambiguities. Three ambiguities. He was suggesting that you needed to, to fix this infrared divergence. One minute. Oh. So this is clearly wrong. This is not the way to go. And we wrote a paper also because we had to really solve this issue. Um, there is no ambiguity. What happens that when you split into regions, you create these spurious divergences. One is an infrared divergence, and it turns out that this guy has an ultraviolet divergence. And when you go in and do the calculations, you realize that those two cancel each other. And then there is no ambiguity. You just you have to clear this properly, so to speak. And we have this already computed this uh, this logarithm ago, so we could just sit and relax and show that we have the calculation. We also could easily reproduce this, uh, uh, the, what it would be the equivalence of the beta logarithm, which is universal. The, the effective theory point of view. Now this is an effective theory jargon. What happens if there is an IR effect? Because we integrated out some theory and physics, we made it a UV effect, and therefore we can use the technologies of effective field theory. Essentially, we normalize it a local operator that will give me this logarithm. Even though it's an IR log, you can compute it from the effective theory point of view as a UV log. And I also talked about like, like the lamp shape, because the same exact same thing happens in the lamp shape. You have UV and IR divergences when you compute in the effective theory and you match to the short distance physics. But when you do the calculation correctly, the same way that we do here, and I don't have time to explain, unfortunately, you not only get the cancellation, you also get for free the factor of I6. And it's something that I read which is correct, there's no ambiguities or anything, and, 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 and it relies on the actual realization that you see especially the cancellation in another regulator, and they use different regulators. This is not obvious, and that's why Luc Blanchet eventually ended up doing the calculation in this way, and also show how the cancellation works. But let me just, I cannot, I don't have time I have, but I, so Mira Gaiman died, right? And I'm watching this video, and he had the opportunity to lash on Feynman, because I don't know, apparently they were not very good friends. But then he said, there was one time in which Feynman said that he was wrong. He publicly said that he was wrong. And then he said he did it in footnote 13, and the 13 was not an, an accident. In a paper when he computed the lamp shift, and it turns out that apparently this guy, French, with Weisskopf, they compute the lamp shift, they show it to Feynman, but they disagree. And Feynman, uh, uh, that's called the beta logarithm, it could have been called the French logarithm, the French logarithm, but, uh, but they held, uh, so Feynman basically told them not to perish because they said they disagree and they said, okay, maybe Feynman is right. But he actually accepted that he did it wrong. So in the very famous paper in which you have the Feynman variance in which he was computing the lamp shift, he accepts that he got it wrong, and it was incorrect, so basically when he joined the two results, they were incorrectly joined to the novel, which is similar to what happens here, to the novel that used to result, and then this guy French, that convinced him that he did it wrong, shows that the relation, I'm gonna get a zero very quickly. Um, okay, so basically he had like an ambiguity parameter that could be fixed if you get the five over six there. In, in any way, but this is a very subtle effect, also for the lamp shift, I'm finishing, that we, God is split. So the 5 over 6 for us is like a 41 over 30 that eventually was also reproduced by um, Luton Company. And we very recently put up the paper in which we show how to do the calculation. And I don't have, I can tell you this if you ask me. Uh, so it would be great. I just want to say one thing. <laughs> so in 93, prior to, um, to LIGO, then Keith Thorne was telling the people, we need better waveforms. Waveforms will be far more complex and carry more information than expected. Improved modeling will be needed. And this is 93, okay? And this is what they knew at the time. They didn't really have the 2.5 effects, okay? In this very famous paper. So right now, okay, here's what, we, this is just new stuff that we could do. Um, that I don't have time, the four, five, we wanna get to here. We are stopping this, we are here, and we're gonna get to here because that's when we see the first non-trivial operator that we can trigger, and we tell us about the nature of the source. And just to emphasize this, if you go to the, 
by Newton's time spiral detection, which by the way, in the title says spiral, they just saw the spiral, so all the information will come from the spiral. They say explicitly, the results from the view do not exclude objects more compact than Newton's star, such as quasi-star, black holes, and more objects. Because we don't have a, yet, an, a, from the gravitational observation alone, we don't have the control in which we can really tell the waveforms uh, very well. Okay, thank you very much. Too quick. I wrote, yes, Ricardo. Oh, sorry, I got a stupid question. So, I've seen recently a talk by Vito Cardoso where he was talking about how to model something crazy like spirals, and he was talking about the echo effect. Oh, can we stop, can we stop, asking, the, no, can no, we no, stop the, the recording? Regime. No, no, I'm asking. Can we stop the recording? Yes. Is there, is there, is there anything? that you can do in the Inspire regime on, is there any modeling that you can do from a nifty perspective? Well, the very systematic. Yes, yes. so the love number will be not zero in that case. Yes. The love number will be not zero in that case. So you can certainly see the deviations from classical GR giving you zero if you start adding modification on the scale of the horizon. Uh, so notice the distinction of uh, what, um, what uh, Leonardo did. So the, the short answer is that there is this operator, and so far it's this operator only, except for the fact of absorption that I didn't talk about, which uh, I will cover. The, there is an effect that has to do with the fact that you need gravitational waves, but you also deform in the black hole, so you lose energy on that. And that also imprints the gravitational waves. And if the object is not exactly a black hole, this effect will also be uh, in the waveforms. And the difference that the number is is this parameter. But the absor absorption is a whole function. So then, th then you can learn a lot. But it's really hard to measure this, number one. Number two is, is what uh, um, um, uh, Leonardo did. So what they do is, OK, you have a scale which is about 200 kilometers. So the black hole will be, uh, well, let's say, over 10. So you can allow for long distance modification. So what I do instead is I go to scales shorter I'm putting all that into my coefficient, so into my operator. So I'm allowing for a lot of things here, but I have to pay the price of the fact that I have a few numbers. And it would be high PN effect. So I have a love number for the quadrupole, then I have an octopole, and so on and so forth. So in terms of parameterizing, yes, there will be corrections here. Now, whether you can tell them apart, um, it's, it's, for example, for the, for the ultra light particles, what we found, which we, we was very nice, is that we, we found that there's square modes and decay modes. There's super instabilities that create this, this guys, but they also can decay away. And by the binary, we create mixing with the decay modes, and then they disappear. This effect is a, it, it, it's a smoking gun. For all effects like this, it will be very, you see a low number not zero, you find yourself a modification of classical G. That would be like, like uh, New York Times, OK? We found an object which is tensor and masses that has non zero deformability. People say, huh? But it turns out that we have never seen something like that in nature, OK? So that's why we need to get to this level of precision. Now, from then on to this, OK, what is it? That it will require really, really high orders, I don't know. I, the short answer is I don't know. But, uh, um, but his modifications are huge. Right, it has to be this Q. It will give you a different Q. There's nothing else you can do. Yes. So I'm all for five p for getting to five yes, p n and yes. so on. But but you do merge, right? And at some point, uh, so, so all, all of this is is in a adiabatic scheme where you have an energy and a flux and you balance them and you slowly merge. No, so I can do there, it. There, I can solve it. Is there, there, is there anything in the whole program that gets you towards the uh, a more dynamical, let's see, regime where where you're not averaging out the flux and you're not uh, you're not just doing an energy balance? Good, good. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I don't need to do an energy balance. I can keep track of the radiation gradient force exactly. Exactly, in, and in fact, I can do. Uh, I, I can also comment on this. You can do a lot of uh, following the, the, all the non-secular and secular effects, and you can follow, for example, l l like a dynamical RG flow. 
you can follow, for example, the evolution exactly without doing the average. Okay? So we, what we do, so we can compute the radiation reaction force. What we usually do is we average it. We can go straight to this guy. So instead of doing this trick with the imaginary path that I told you about, we can directly compute this guy. I don't have time to tell you how. This is done with the inning. So we can do this. Now the question you might ask is when you go closer to the merge, when the post Newtonian expansion itself starts to break. But that would be interesting if these ideas of, of amplitudes and double copies and so on can be extended to fully classical solutions. Because then maybe we can map to a problem in which we can maybe use other tools and I have a better understanding of why the waveforms look so nice, right? In, even during the merger phase. But the other thing that is that, so we have analytic control on the, on the spiral. Once you constrain those guys, then you can tell the merger, and if you have a theory, what, what you should see. Because the hard part about effective zero for a merger is that you don't know how to do effective zero in the computer, okay? The ring down you can do with the spiral, you can do with the merger, unless you have equations that you can um, have expansions. I don't know how to do. Uh, Yes. How, how interesting is it to go in the Postminkov scheme expansion at higher order? Good question. So for the binary case, it turns out this was something that was also analyzed by uh, Alessandro's group. The 3 p.m. effect it, it, has, it doesn't do much, but how effects might be might be relevant because the way it's done right now is that we we stitch together the inspire with the merger and the ring down, and so they do some kind of resummation that is called the effective one body approach. And there's also phenomenological waveforms. Yeah, because this is also interesting for the inspiring. This is a scattering process. So what you do is that you have a scattering process, and then you have some potential here. <coughs> then you feed this into okay, a bound state, OK? Because that's what we are. We don't, well, it could be flybys, right? If we, if we care about say, the angle. This we can measure very well in post-mink. But we care about this problem. So you need a step in which from here, something that is, you can apply to here. If you do that, then it could be that you can describe dynamics better by resumming a lot of the velocity terms. At the stage we are right now, no. But in the future, it might. 